Hello there. <laughs> it has been a very long time, probably over a year, if not longer, that I actually recorded a video. Um, I sit down and I want to make this video over and over and over and over again, and then something always happens. <sighs> More importantly, I have been sick. Uh, and when I say sick, I don't have COVID um, or anything like that. I have something called Chiari malformation. So basically, um, that's a big long word. <laughs> and Chiari malformation is something that affects the brain. And it affects the eyes, the balancing, anything to do with your brain, basically. Um, and I'm really forgetful. So... I have a very, um, like a short-term memory problem right now. And it is affecting my eyesight. So this eye, I have a lot of floaters. And basically everything on the left-hand side of my body uh, has been affected. And um, it's been a nightmare, literally. Uh, I haven't been reading, well, I have been reading books. Um... I just haven't been reading them and then wanting to review them on here. Oh, almost dropped, almost dropped you. So uh, that's basically because I don't have the energy. So when I'm reading a book, I just want to read it, enjoy it, and then that's it. I'm, I haven't even really been doing anything on Goodreads. Um, or if I do, then it's like days, 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 days later. So when I remember that I should do it. I uh, first got diagnosed with Chiari back in 2020, early 2020, I believe it was. Um, it's a long story. So I'm going to try to make it as short as possible so this video is not like 700 hours long but moving forward what's going to end up happening is that I'm going to be documenting my journey with Kiari on this channel um, I'm going to try my hardest to get back into reviewing books because I've read a lot of really good books recently and um, yeah that, so like that's where it's gonna go this channel is going to document I am having surgery which I just said, <laughs> um, hopefully in 2021, if not sooner, I don't think it'll be in December. Um, I'm going to say it's probably going to be in January or early February. So here goes the story. First of all, Chiari malformation is basically when your brain is too big for your skull. So I have a big brain. Everybody knows how smart I am. So, well, smart assed. No. How smart I am has nothing to do with having a big brain. It's just that your brain is big. Um, and it's so big that your skull can't handle it. And it's leaking into the base of my neck. So the cerebellum is into the tonsils, it's called. Um, tonsil cerebellum is what the, it's called. I will link all of the information down below if you want to look at it. It's actually really scary. Um, I knew a little YouTuber who had this. She was, well, her mom's a YouTuber and she, her name is Alyssa and she's, the, the daughter's Alyssa, and she had this and I used to watch her all the time and I was rooting for her and she had so many surgeries at such a young age. Uh, I believe she was like three when she first had her surgery. So if she can do this, I can do this. I am 45. You know, I'm not worried about the surgery. I'm more worried about after the fact because I think I'm going to be living on this couch for a very long time when I come home I'm going to have a collar um they're going to cut into the back of my neck and um I'll be a zipper head is what we call people who have had surgery because the scar can be anywhere from this big or like long it, it just you know depends I will try to put a actually I'll put a picture of it right here right now of somebody who has had surgery okay so that's gross right yeah <laughs> 
I mean, it is what it is. I am looking forward to surgery. And it's been a very, very big, long, long road to get to here. So let's try to shorten it. I've had migraines for a very long time. And when I say a very long time, I mean like 20 years, if not longer. Um, they would come and go. I could take medicine for it and it would be fine. Um, I would, you know, lay in a dark room with stuff over my head, on my head, on the back of my neck. And, and it would go away and it was fine. Um, when we had our daughter, she was still born at birth and, um, I had an epidural that failed and then, so they did it again and then it only worked to, um, some extent. So basically only a little bit of me was frozen rather than the whole, my whole body and one of the side effects that they thought that I was having was called an epidural headache so that my head was so sore that I would have to get cortisone shots in my head and neck and face almost every three weeks, I think it was. And that went on for a very long time, for months, um, like four months at least. And then one day it just went away, which was just really, really strange. Uh, my doctor prescribed something and didn't work. Another pill didn't work. I tried every single pill on the face of the earth. Nothing worked. The cortisone shots started to, I think, build up the resistance and it went away. Then when we had our son um, nine years ago, almost nine years ago, it happened again with the epidural. I only had one epidural, but it happened again. But it was worse, like so much worse. It actually lasted the headache. And when I say headache, I don't just mean like a little bit of a headache. Like it was the worst migraine pain I've ever felt in my life. Like up here was always constantly like boom, 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 boom. And, and my neck and I don't know, this lasted, I want to say like eight months. I had many tests in those eight months. They tested for a brain bleed. They tested for, um, meningitis I mean like so many things but for one thing I didn't have I did not have an MRI done for whatever reason my doctor put me on Tylenol 4s and prednisone and the prednisone just made my face swell up um and I didn't really feel any better with it so I went off of the prednisone I still on the Tylenol 4s and this has been nine years later not gonna lie they don't do anything other than I can get a little bit work done during the day. Whereas if I don't take them, then I can't get anything done. I'll be like in so much pain. Okay. So then I just kind of built up a resistance towards the migraines. I tried every single pill on the face of the earth. I did medical marijuana, which you can see on this channel. Many times I've documented that. Um, and then they... It became legal in Ontario or Canada, and um, I don't know if it's all of Canada. I think it's all of Canada. Yeah, it's legal everywhere here in Canada. Anyways, it's legal now, so it's like a dispensary in every single solitary place you can just go in and buy it. So it's actually a lot better than me ordering it from and having to go to this doctor. So that actually helps. It helps me more than anything else has ever helped. But it's not a cure. It's just, it's making me feel better. I started going to a pain doctor, which I don't know if I documented on this channel or on This Is Writer, where he would give me shots in my head and my face and cortisone shots in my back of my neck and the top of my skull. Every single, well, he wouldn't do the cortisone shots, but he would do every, the um, other pellets, the other shots. I think it was Moderna. I, I don't remember what it was. And basically what was happening is it was supposed to help with the pain. Well, it didn't. And I was going every single Thursday for almost two years. My neck was so sore, I couldn't move it. Again, I got tested for meningitis. They're like, no, you don't have it. The pain doctor was like, I don't understand why it's this isn't helping. So he set me up with um, a spinal MRI. But 
it takes so long for an MRI in this friggin' Canada that it was like five months and I still hadn't heard anything or something ridiculous like that. So then it was Christmas, just before Christmas Eve, um, 2019, and I couldn't move my neck at all, at all. Like I could not do this. If I did that, if I tried to do it, it was just stiff and I shouldn't have done that because that actually really hurt. Um, and there's a really bad pain. It's like this, this elastic. So like, it's like this and I can feel when it stretches out, it, it hurts so bad. So I had to go to the emergency room. I was actually blacking out like, um, this I started getting really, really bad where I was like stars in it and I felt like I was going to pass out. I went to the emergency room finally because my husband was like, you need to get a cortisone shot. And I had stopped going to the pain doctor because, um, well, no, I hadn't stopped going. I was still going to the pain doctor at this time, but I had, had just had a cortisone shot and he wasn't able to legally give it to me again. So he said I would have to do it at the emergency room if I wanted another one. So I went there and they were going to do it. And then I had a really nice doctor who finally listened to me. And he's, he said, the emergency room doctor, and he said, you know what? I think that you need a full MRI, but we're going to do a CAT scan right now. So we did the CAT scan and it came back this one that I had something at the back of my neck and he was really concerned. Um, he said that the radiologist thought that I had um, hypertensive something, something, something. So basically high blood pressure in the brain or something. And he was really, 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 really concerned. Uh, they actually scheduled the MRI for basically two weeks from, because it was like an emergency situation. So like he couldn't get me in till two weeks or something or a week or, I mean, like it was really, really quick. And I told him I was waiting for the spinal MRI. However, I hadn't had the spinal MRI yet. So, um, he said, okay, well, I'm just going to go ahead and do this MRI for your head. When the results came back from the MRI, he actually called me himself at, from his home and said, you have something called Chiari malformation and you, the brain, your brain is leaking into the back of your skull and it is 6.5 millimeters or some, I, I don't actually remember what he told me it was. Um, it was enough that he wanted me to have surgery right away. And he said he already had talked to a surgeon and that they were setting up the surgeon date that the surgeon wanted to see me in person. However, I was having, going to have surgery and it was already scheduled for like March 16th or something like that. So like it was emergency situation. So that was, um, he called me January, I think it was January, 2020 was when he told me that or February, early February, 2020. So great. He told me that I wasn't allowed to bend, lift, um, anything. And he's like, I'm going to save your life. I'm going to, you know, like if this goes undiagnosed any longer, you could be paralyzed and a lot of things can happen. There's a lot of scary things that can happen, including being paralyzed. Um, like I could lose my voice. I could lose the ability to swallow, which I actually do have. Now keep in mind that I said that that was early 2020. It is now going to be 2022. So this is November 24th, 2020 right now. I still haven't had surgery. They had said that if I didn't have surgery back then, all of these things would happen. And lo and behold, all of these things are happening. I'm not paralyzed by any means, but walking and um, I'm very unbalanced. I do fall a lot. I've fallen and hit in my head. I've fallen, um, passed out not remembered anything. I get confused when I leave the house, if I'm by myself. Um, there's a number of things that have happened that they did say that was going to happen. Um, you know, I do have swallowing problems. Uh, if I eat something that isn't just something that I have to chew, 
like bread and basically carbs bread pasta stuffing um i don't eat a lot of meat but if i do eat meat it gets stuck here and I choke. So I have to put my hands on my head and then like literally I'm choking. Like it happened in New at um our Thanksgiving in Canada. We have Thanksgiving in October. It happened then. I'm sorry this camera's shaking. My hands have decided now that they're shaking. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna try to put you down. I'm holding on to it because I didn't want to get the whole thing and I'm doing it from the phone. Normally I get the camera, the tripod, everything, but I just don't have the energy right now to do it. And I wanted to get this video out since it's already super late and this is a long ass video <laughs> i'm trying not to make it long but i know it's going to be at least 20 minutes so bear with me i know i want to have a part two um so yes okay so then fast forward to or rewind i guess till march 2020 when i was about to have the surgery i had spoken to the surgeon um, on the phone at the end of February, he told me everything he was going to do. So basically he was going to cut in the back of my head. He was going to remove the, um, cerebellum completely from my brain. And then he was going to put a patch using a piece of my side of my, um, butt basically, or my thigh, something from my own skin and make a little hammock back there. But he, they removed the bones completely from the back of my neck and saw them off completely. They removed them completely. They get rid of them. They never have, they're never there again. So he told me the plan. He told me how long I was going to be in the hospital. I was booked for 10 days um, in the ICU or in the ICU for two days and then the rest of the time in a room by myself for 10 days uh, because I've had ESBL superbug before. So then I get a private room by myself. And then he told me I'd come home with a hard collar. He gave me a soft collar, which I do have over there. Or he didn't give it to me. He told me to go buy it. I went and bought a soft collar. Um, I mean, like, we had the plan. And that was, like, end of February. So then, like, I think it was, like, February 18th when I talked to him on the phone. And he said he wasn't going to see me in person. He would just see me at the hospital on that day. So I went to the hospital on that day and COVID hit literally, literally two days before that the world shut down. Now I didn't, nobody called me. Nobody told me, Hey, guess what? I, I'm not going to still have this surgery. Uh, I mean, like we didn't really know the extent of everything that was happening. I mean, like, and I was actually sick. I had just got over being sick. Um, because we went to Toronto February 20th for my husband's birthday. And when we came home a couple days later, we all got really, really sick. And we didn't know what was happening. And I was still sick. And this was like March 13th or 14th or whatever day it was. I was still sick, but I was feeling a lot better, if that makes sense. I was just really, really run down. But I wasn't coughing anymore. And my chest still felt really tight. But um, I believe all three of us had COVID at the time. Um, that's a whole different story. I will talk about that another time if you guys want to know about that. But I'm like 100% sure we all had COVID. Um, there's no other explanation for what has happened. And the three of us don't get sick together. And my husband never gets sick. Like I'm talking never gets sick. He hasn't been sick prior to that in like eight years maybe. I mean like literally doesn't ever get sick. I get sick a lot. My kid gets sick, but not to that extent. Sorry. Okay, so <laughs> I go to the pre-op. I had already talked to an anesthesiologist, everything. Can't get in the hospital. They're like, no, there's no surgeries. Nobody called you? I'm like, what do you mean there's no surgeries? And they're like, there's no surgeries. And like, this is the day before, because you have to do a pre-op. So it was the day before the surgery. And, um, yeah, so I go back home and I feeling like an idiot cause I don't know. And we don't have masks at the time cause it wasn't a mask situation at the time. So I don't get surgery. Nobody calls me. Nobody tells me anything. I don't know what's going on. Finally, like a week later, two weeks later, 
the sur I leave all these messages for the surgeon's office and, and I actually go over there because it's like not that far from the hospital. And they finally call me and tell me that it's shut down because of COVID. I mean, like, literally, this is just the beginning of, you know, COVID. Nobody knows anything. So it was all just a big kerfuffle. Then he tells me, you know, as soon as we have a plan, we'll have a plan and we'll we'll continue to do the surgery as soon as he's allowed to do surgeries. Well, then, you know what? The whole world goes to hell. We can't do surgeries. They can't do anything. The hospitals are, I mean, like it wasn't closed, but it was just closed. It was just open for emergencies. That's it, right? So, <laughs> so I go with the whole entire summer in pain, literally in pain, um, the whole summer's ruined. I mean, COVID shuts everything down. Our whole lives shut down. We're not allowed to do anything. And here I am, a hundred times worse than I was just suffering. And I mean, like, I'm grateful that the world was shut down because I would have just powered through the everything um, with our kid going to all of the things that he was going to. You know, like, he was in... Um, swimming lessons, karate, soccer, we went to homeschooling events three times a week, and he did meetups um, on one of those, so like four times a week, basically, we were doing homeschooling things, and going to like a drop-in gym, so that he could play sports with other homeschooling kids, so like, we were very busy. And then the world shuts down. And then I was still doing all those things. It didn't matter to me. I was still doing it. I was powering through for my kid. It didn't matter if I wasn't supposed to lift or bend or whatever. I was still doing it. Hindsight, not such a smart idea. However, it is what it is. When you have a child, you just do what you want to do. You just do what you have to do. So then we have all this time to do nothing. I'm getting super, super frustrated. I don't know what to do. Then they open up surgeries again and the doctor sees us in person sees me in person I bring my husband and he tells me that he wants to do some further testing because he doesn't think that operation is what I need and I'm like completely blindsided because it was set up for like March right so it, it was all a nightmare I remind him of everything he says, and then he says, well, let's just do this patch test where they take your blood. I don't even know what it was. I don't even know. Some stupid patch test. And he's like, I'll get that set up as soon as possible. And maybe you should go to a sleep study again, even though I already went. Because I was, um, I throw up. If I'm laying flat, then I throw up in the, and choke on the vomit and um can't breathe and basically i kill myself in the middle of the night if i don't sleep like this or i have a special pillow that i use and if i don't use that pillow then that happens or if like something happens and i'm even even with the pillow i still it still happens quite often fast forward a couple months it's like october 2020 now go back and see him and he's and he's like did you ever get those tests done and I'm like you never set them up I called and they said that you never set them up and he's like well then why are you here and I'm like well because I had an appointment with you and he's like well I only wanted to see you after you had the testing and I'm like this is getting ridiculous he said all this other stuff never followed through with it me and my husband are super pissed at this point. I'm like, you know what? You're fired. Like you're this is ridiculous. I don't feel like you're taking this seriously. Um you know, I, I this is ridiculous. I, I'm, I, you're fired. Like, I fired him. I was crying. He was like, oh, blah, 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 stop crying. And I'm like, you don't understand what it is to live with this. And he's like, well, I've seen patients. And I'm like, unless you've lived through it, you don't know. And he's like, well, I'm not saying I'm not going to do surgery. I'm going to do surgery. It's just that I want to have these tests done. And I'm like, I don't know. And then he was like, oh, it's not going to work anyways. And he was like trying to talk me out of it and telling me how dangerous it was for him to be in the operating room. And I, I mean, it was all ridiculous. I fired him and, and yet he still called me at the end of the year. So just before Christmas 2020, 
so like a year ago almost, and said, okay, I'm going to do the surgery as soon as I'm allowed to have privileges again at the hospital for, to do surgeries, because then they shut surgeries down again, right? Only emergency surgeries. Um, as soon as I'm allowed to ha do it, you're the first on the list. So we're talking February. I'm like, you know what? I'm already frustrated with you. So if this doesn't happen, I have fired you. Do you not remember this? Like, and he was like, well, I don't think that's the best course of action. Let's just do this surgery. And like, he acted like as if he was doing me a favor rather than his job. So in the meantime, I started looking around. I'm in a Chiari group for Ontario people. That's where I live, Ontario, Canada. And, um, I start looking around and I'm like, hey, where does anybody know of a good surgeon? I don't care where it is. At this point, I will go anywhere. And then I talked to a girl who said, hey, you know what? I just had surgery um, in July or June of like the previous year, like in, or like 2020 um, in Hamilton. And I'm like, you had surgery? And she's like, yeah, it was like an emergency thing. So I had to have it. And I was like, what? And I said, well, when did you get diagnosed? And she had just got diagnosed like in January and she had surgery in July. So I'm like, what? Who's that doctor? So then she gave me the information. I had seen a neuro neurologist in the meantime. Um, sorry, I'm playing with my hair. It's really bothering me. <laughs> it's, uh, in the meantime, and he said all this stuff and did say, hey, you know what, get a second opinion from this guy in our town. And I did all the neurology tests again. It was like the third time I did it. I failed it all, failed the 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 test. Basically, the, um, it's like early onset Alzheimer's is what he had said, even though I don't have Alzheimer's, but it's like acting like that because I don't remember anything. So he told me, like, he gave me all these tests and said, hey, do you want, like, these are the five things I want you to remember. And I couldn't remember, sorry, I couldn't remember the five things at, at like the end of the 20 minute session or whatever it was. So yeah. And then he told me, yes, get a second opinion. And I said, well, I heard about this guy. Can you refer me to him? And he said, yes. So he did. And within a month I got called, I went down to Hamilton where it was and which is about almost like not even an hour from here maybe 45 minutes from where I live and he said yes you're a very good candidate and I want you to have another MRI done so then this will be like my third one and we'll go from there and then as soon as I have that MRI booked and we see the see it we will schedule the surgery I'm like wow okay so then I have it have the other MRI, go back to Hamilton, have the MRI there. And then within like three days, he calls me and says, okay, so now you're no longer six, six millimeters or whatever I was. He's like, you are. And then I was like 12, the second one. So I like doubled. And then now he says I was like 22 millimeters or something like something where it was like extreme. Like I went from six to 22. So obviously it was growing and based like going down further. And basically that happens when you don't take care of yourself. When you, I still bend, I still lift, I still, you know, like as much as like COVID was there and I didn't have to do any of this stuff. I still, you still have to live. You still have to like even bending to go, when you go into the bathroom or like the shower or like taking a bath, anything like sneezing coughing, tying your shoes, like anything. Um, so he said, I'm concerned about that. We need to get you in right away. So then he scheduled it or didn't schedule it. No, he didn't schedule it. He didn't actually physically schedule it. He said that the anesthesiologist would call me and he said that it would be in the next two weeks. So then that didn't happen. Um, so I called back and he said, Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sorry, um, what happened is that COVID, again, so we're like on our second COVID go-around, has basically all the patients that have COVID who didn't get vaccinated and didn't wear masks and everything, um, 
well, I don't know that that's the reason why, but whatever. And he, they all went to Hamilton Hospital, so there was no room for anybody that needed to have surgery. So, that wasn't great news for me. Um, I was really, really upset, obviously. He said that I'm first on the list, and that we went through the surgery again of what he was going to do. And he was basically going to do everything the same the surgeon in Kitchener was going to do. However, he was going to do it better. He wasn't actually going to remove the the big pouch at the back of my head. So, he wasn't going to cut into it. He wasn't going to do it, anything like that. He was just going to... um make it bigger so that yes it would still be going down but it wouldn't be touching my spine said i would have the hard color i mean like we went through everything in detail and then he said okay i think it was like july or something yeah he said okay you'll have it in july whatever whatever it was and then like not even a week later his secretary calls and said Okay, so I know you're waiting to have this surgery as soon as everything works back up, opens back up, but unfortunately, he's due to no, something about, I don't know, no, something, no fault of his own or something that he was going to be taking the next three months off, and um, that he had to leave the country unexpectedly and I was like what and she said yes so you're looking at probably September before you'll have surgery and I was like holy okay um whatever it was I can't remember I don't think it was September whatever she said she said you know three months and I said okay and a month went by not even so like I think not even not even I don't even know like maybe like in August she called and said okay so I just want to let you know that unfortunately um or maybe she did call in September maybe it was September unfortunately he had to quit his practice and shut it down and he's not coming back um to the country anymore like he's not coming back to Canada so then I'm thinking in my head that he's either died or <laughs> that he has decided that, hey, guess what? I get to practice somewhere else. So let's do it there. Right? Um, I don't know. Whatever. I come to find out that he actually had a brain tumor. And I just found this out last week or two weeks ago that he had a brain tumor and that he had to have surgery. In, and he had it in Boston because, you know, obviously. And. Uh, um, money talks and he has money so he went to Boston had brain surgery there and is resting and recovering in there and and in hindsight it's great that he didn't operate because like you know a lot of shit can happen especially with a brain tumor right so <laughs> it's crazy he referred me to another surgeon and she said okay this is the surgeon's name and they will contact you and you're first on the list, blah, 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 blah. So that's August, I think, 2021, I think, now, uh, or September, maybe September. I don't know. Yeah, maybe, yeah, September. So then a few days later, I get a call. This is so-and-so from such-and-such's surgeon's office. You've been referred to us, unfortunately, um, he does not feel like he can touch your Chiari because it's too advanced for him and too severe now. And he's looked over the MRI and he has referred you to the best of the best in Hamilton. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> so then in October, I get a letter in the mail saying who I'm referred to. The time, the date to go back to go back to Hamilton to see this new surgeon and his name is Dr. Wong. And I looked him up and if you want to look him up, he's ama like amazing. Like he made a portable GPS. I don't know what that means, but he designed that 
um, for patients. He has uh, did brain surgery on people who are awake. I mean, basically, he's like like the surgeons you see on Grey's Anatomy. He's that surgeon, like that neurosurgeon. He's like, what's her face? What is her face? What is her name? Derek's sister on Grey's Anatomy. Who's the neurosurgeon? Her. I don't know her name now. Anyways, it's not important. I go and see him. I saw him in person to talk about the surgery um, this month? November? Yes. So at the beginning of November, I went and saw him. He wasn't there, which is just a big laughable moment for me because go figure, right? He's not there. Um... But I saw the person who was taking over for him who will also be assisting in the office. He was there, but he got him called into emergency surgery. And um, I ended up, after the end of the appointment, I ended up, did run into him in the hallway. He was coming out of the surgery. And he, like, he came out of the surgery, obviously. And he was, he had talked to one of the patients that was waiting for him. And then he had a salad and um, some water. And he was, like, rushing, I guess, to go and eat his lunch, finally. And I said, oh, are you Dr. Wong? And he's like, yes, are you Angela? And I said, yes. And he's like, oh, my God, I'm rushing to come see you. And I said, no, no, don't worry about it. I did tell the guy that it didn't matter. Um, I didn't need to speak to you in person. He he went over everything. And he's like, oh, okay, are you sure? Cause... And I said, no, go eat your lunch. You know, I'll see you when I see you. <laughs> so they are scheduling the surgery for two months from the day that I had seen him, which was like November 6th or 7th or 8th or whatever. Um, and the appointment was wonderful. I did all of the neuro test again. We went over my MRI and we went over the CAT scans. We went over all of the, my symptoms, which is, you know, the blurry vision in this eye, my like basically face paralysis in this face where I mean, like, I can't feel this. Like I'm using my nail to do this and I cannot feel this. This doesn't hurt at all. I could like put a nail in it. I could cut myself. It doesn't hurt. Um, this whole side of my body hurts. I have like tremors every once in a while in this hand. I drop stuff. I'm clumsy. The neck pain, obviously. Um, every single symptom I have that is related to Chiari now makes sense in my brain. Makes sense that I've had this my whole entire life. Undiagnosed. And... It hurts. It hurts my inside that if it wasn't for this one doctor that finally listened to me and didn't just say, hey, guess what? You're overweight. You have high blood pressure, blah, blah, blah. I mean, like, I used to be 95 pounds soaking wet and five feet tall and everybody was always like, oh, you have to gain weight. You have to gain weight. You have to gain weight. So when I did gain weight after having, um, well, actually before having our daughter, with all the different medication I was on, I gained a lot of weight, especially with the prednisone, and I never could lose it. And now I'm overweight considerably, and it's like every doctor was just always like, okay, it's just because you're overweight. Well, it's not because I'm overweight. It's because I actually have a brain condition, a very rare brain condition that nobody took seriously. Nobody. Nobody. The number of times I've had CAT scans, I've had ultrasounds, I've had everything, and nobody took me seriously. It hurts. It hurts me that my family doctor never, ever once said, hey, you could have this. I know it's rare, but if you Google my symptoms, that's the first thing that comes up. So, <laughs> I don't know. It is what it is now, but I'm 45. And the surgery is extensive. It's dangerous. It might not work now. There's a number of things. I may not have to. I may have to have another surgery. I actually am. Um, my brain fluid is restricted. So one of the things he said is that I'm going to have to have a second surgery somewhere down the line if this doesn't work to put a shunt in my head and. 
so I could have three or four or five surgeries, but I'm not going to. The first surgery is going to work and he's going to help me 100%. I know it. I can feel it on my bones. There's no way that I didn't go through all of this just to end up having to have multiple surgeries. There's no way. It's been two years of hell, hell and stress. And if someone would have told me back in 2019 that in 2021 I'd still be in the exact same pain, if not a thousand times worse. Like I almost feel like calling that doctor in Cambridge and telling him, guess what? I haven't had surgery yet. You know what? I might. I might do that. Anyways, <laughs> COVID has messed up everything. And if it wasn't for COVID, I don't know. But I am a big believer in everything happens for a reason, unfortunately. And I think I had to go through this journey. And go through all of the doctors and go through all of the nightmares and go through all of the pain. To get to this one doctor who's going to save my life for real. Who's going to fix me. And I don't think that, I think if I would have had surgery back in March in 2020 from the doctor here in my town, and COVID wasn't a thing, I think I'd still be in worse off. I think I'd be worse off, if that makes any sense. I truly believe that he wasn't the one that was supposed to save me. And I didn't like his bedside manner and he wasn't a nice person. I mean, like on the phone, he was great, but in person, he was terrible. So, I don't think it was meant to be. And then that doctor in Hamilton having the brain, no. The, the aneurysm or whatever, his brain tumor, whatever he had, no. He could have died on the operating, he could have died while he was operating on me. Like, he didn't die, but like, I mean, like... No. <laughs> no, it wasn't meant to be. So, I told you this was going to be a long story. Now it's like 45 minute video. I hope you watch it. I may put this in two parts, but probably not. I think I'm just going to go ahead and put it all out there for you cuz it's going to I'm going to document the whole entire surgery. Um I should have documented me going to the test and everything, but everything happened so quick after and getting in to see that Dr. Wong and I mean like I had a friend with me and I mean like it's been it's hard and especially now with COVID and um it's it's hard. I did take pictures and I'll maybe I'll insert a couple of my brain pictures here and and <laughs> pictures from going there and I do think I do have a couple videos but um there's a lot of stuff on my Instagram that I've documented this journey too so if you want to go over there it's Arrow Angie 1976 the link is in the description down there too so okay so woo <laughs> I dropped you I dropped you see I dropped you that tells me I need to let you go thank you so much for watching um if you have any questions, let me know. Like I said, the next videos will be all about surgery and me in the hospital. I'll be in the hospital alone and I don't think I can have video visitors. I don't know. So don't forget to give this a like, thumbs up, and let me know. Let me know if you have any questions.